Uh, I'm going to do this talk in English, um, but if you have any questions, you should um, find out that too. Um, by the way, um, if you have any questions, um, show up right away. I much prefer that our, our questions is just at the end of the talk. Um, I much prefer talks that basically come conversations uh, with you just than just me talking and you listening. So, don't hesitate, just ask. Um, uh, yeah, I'm Lena Panoy, I'm working on a system of project, as you might know. Um, today, um, this talk will be about the security and sandboxing with system. Um, the background of the talk is, um, I mean, we live in a post-known world these days, and uh, security, um, uh, IT security is more important as it never was before. Um, like, as we know, the systematically, um, three-letter agencies of this world um, attack systems, and, and so do um, just normal hackers as well to add them to their, to their botnets um, and similar things. So, um, I think um, it is it's really, really important today that systems that are built today come with security built in. Um, I'm an operating systems guy, guy of course. Um, I work on System D, which is probably one of the more core components of the operating system. And hence, I think it's uh, um, the duty of, uh, of, of our project really to make sure that uh, security is built into everything right from the beginning. Um, yeah. In this talk, I, I want to focus on some of these security and sandboxing features, specifically on the security and sandboxing features that apply to um, services that can run on the system. Um, security for, um, generally has this problem that it's seldom an enabler, right? It is usually disabler. Meaning that, that um, if you're an administrator or, or a developer and you put together your system, um, then you usually don't care that much of security because the goal that you are supposed to deliver is seldom secured. It's supposed, like, uh, let's say you build an IoT light bulb, then your goal is really to build an IoT light bulb. Well, any kind of security is um, usually just a secondary goal. Um, hence, um, yeah, security never enables you to do something. It prohibits people to do something, like uh, something that you don't want them to do. So, um, and that, that, that's usually the, 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 the problem of security things, that getting into the hands of normal developers and normal administrators that security matters is, is always difficult because, um, yeah, if you're short on time, um, you, you build your stuff up to the point where it works, and then that's the end of the story. Hence, um, to make security digestible and acceptable to people, um, we need to make it as simple as possible. And, and, and uh, with the stuff that I'm talking about, um, I kind of hope that we deliver that. So, um, this is supposed to be the antithesis in a way to the complexity that systems like SLinux or, or other systems like that kind of push on you because they generally have this problem that they're relatively complex. And um, if it's um, difficult to convince people anyway to do security, then it's particularly difficult to um, do security that is complex. Because, I don't know, I can personally admit that uh, I don't really grasp um, the details of SLinux myself. And, uh, for, thankfully, it's not my project, so I have to. But, um, I don't know, if, if I can't understand that and we have a lot of interfacing with the SLNX, then I'm, I'm pretty sure, like, I think there's something wrong with my phone, good feedback. Um, uh, anyway, so, yeah, the, the complexity is, is a bad thing. So, with these things, um, I really try to focus, like, we really try to focus to make them as easy as possible. Meaning that essentially most of these things are booleans or, or, or very, very simple settings that you can turn on for your services. Now, yeah, um, let's take one step back. I kind of like did this part already today in the, in the, in the, in the morning for, for my keynote, but just briefly, what System B does is service management, and hence the security that we want to focus on here is the security that it can apply to services as a whole, right? But the service manager that System B is can apply to service while running it. Um, a little bit of background first. I'm not sure, I have, has everybody of you already looked at a unit file, like a systemd unit file? Does, is there somebody who has not ever looked at a systemd unit file? One person. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty. Um, okay, for that one person, uh, let's quickly um, uh, have a look about the, what, what that is. The unit file is basically how you configure the various things that systemd manages. This is things that systemd manages we call units. You know? Um, 
Units can be a very variety of things. They can be malformed devices and a couple of other things. The most relevant unit type is called a service. And um, if we talk about unit files that implement services, system services, then we call them service files. This is how one of them looks like. Uh, this is just, I, I just put, picked a random one from my Fedora system. This one is a router advertisement demo file. I picked it because it's relatively easy, right? Like, um, if, you, if you look at the unit files for more complex services, like I don't know, Apache or something, they tend to be a little bit longer than this. Um, it was our, our ultimate goal to make these things as simple as possible, but you know how things go. Now, um, I don't really want to go into too much detail what this all does because this is not supposed to be a primer about uh, unit files. Um, but uh, yeah, you have a description here. You say what's the binary to start. You say um, the, how that binary shall report that it's finished starting up. You specify the PLE file. And this is about uh, an ending in, uh, to the system. I think most of this is relatively easy to understand for somebody that has uh, already come in contact with uh, Unix in some way or another. Um, yeah, and now the stuff that I actually want to talk about is, is on this slide where we add in these three things. Because these three things, for example, are something that uh, help um, locking down this demo um, in a very simple, I think, and very efficient way. Right? If we run it like this, it will just work. Right? But if you run it like this, it will work, but it will also um, uh, have some security policies applied. So make it a little bit um, safer to run. Um, yeah, like the first one, private CP, um, is one that actually, like distribution like Fedora actually managed to turn it on across the board for many, many of the services. Not for all of them, but for many. Uh, private CP um, fixes one of the major um, uh, security, like sources of security vulnerabilities on Unix, which is handling of the slash temp file system. Um, slash temp, everybody here probably knows that is, is where you can put temporary files. Now, um, it's very easy to misuse slash temp or not use it properly. Um, and uh, that's because it's a shared namespace, meaning that every service that runs, every program that runs, if it's your, your graphical UI program or it's a system service, they all can write to slash temp and can do that under any name they like. Now, if programs hard code their names, this makes them more vulnerable because other programs can um, use, um, like, I mean, for example, if many programs hard code something like um, slash temp slash foobar. And if another program does the same thing um, and gets there first, it will own that file, and then the first um, program can't work anymore because that name is already taken. So you effectively implemented a DOS there. Um, this is very simple to explain and to understand, but still, um, many, many, many programs suffer by this still. So, with private TP, um, you get this very simple pool. You either take yes or no. no. Um, and if you turn it on, then slash temp, temp will actually not be slash temp anymore for that one specific service, but it will be a private instance of it. Um, what this basically means is like the, that the service will see everything on the system the same way as you would if you, if you uh, have your own login shell, with one exception, slash temp, or with two exceptions actually, with slash temp and slash var temp, will um, be a private um, uh, playground for that service. Whatever um, the service writes there um, will not show up on the um, main version of slash temp, and vice versa. Um, yeah, it's very, very simple to use, um, in a very, very uh, efficient way. Um, so, but, but the key to understand here really is that um, other than these two directories, while temp and temp, everything else stays the same. Like all the other directories look exactly the same way and uh, can be acted the same way. Um, again, if you have any questions about anything, just look up the right way. But so far, nobody has. Um, yeah, Protex system full. I think like I have uh, some slides about the other ones a little bit later, but actually about private TP. But as we'll go into that a little bit later in more detail, um, just very briefly right now, Protex system equals full. It basically allows you to uh, run a service without any write access to the system. Are you implementing private TP under the is your bind bound? Yeah, so the, I'm supposed to repeat the question. So the question was um, uh, whether that's implemented with a bind mount. It's uh, implemented with namespacing, and um, there's a bind mount in place. And uh, specifically, the, the, what, what happens actually is that there's a temporary directory created the proper way in slash temp on the host, and then that is mounted onto the 
uh, slash temp for the service. Um, so the admin actually still has access to that private version of slash temp because it is just another private directory in slash temp, if anybody of you follow what I was just saying. Um, but yeah, Protect System um, allows you to, to monitor the entire uh, tree of the operating system we're doing. Meaning that um, uh, uh, programs um, like which have that set cannot modify slash user anymore. Um, and that is a big, big um, uh, benefit because, I mean, usually it should only be the package manager the distribution, something like DEP or, or RPM, to, that manipulates the slash user, right? Like at the time when the system is operated or it's told. After that, access to slash user should not happen. Like, write access to slash user should not happen. It should be essentially a read only vendor location where all the resources of the operating system are inside. And as such, for many, pretty much all demons, this is something you should just turn on. If you do, slash user becomes very early, and you can be sure that if somebody manages to exploit the router version of demon for IPv6, that um, it can maybe see things on the system, but it can at least not modify your operating system anymore. And that's a, that's a big, big benefit. And Project Turn is something like that that uh, uh, protects um, access to slash home, meaning that the, that the user's home directories um, can either not be um, written to or can even be seen. Um, but yeah, we'll come to that later. We have another about that. Does uh, Protect System Pool uh, protect everything? So also, the show is only readable? Uh, no, like, um, uh, like these are supposed to be separate, so that with Protect Home you control the access to the show and Protect System the rest. And okay. Protect System actually has um, a couple of settings, but I'm they have, we'll have to check the main page first. Um, <laughs> Uh, which ones they are. We added something very recently, that's why I'm a little bit confused about that. But basically, um, there's one way you can say, um, I want uh, uh, slash user redoubling. There's uh, one stronger setting, um, and this one is already the stronger setting, where you say slash Etsy and slash user are redoubling, meaning that configuration cannot be modified anymore because most demons do not need to configuration. Uh, to change configuration, and changing configuration should be exclusively an admin's job. Um, and then there's one even stronger that basically mounts everything with only, with the exception of a couple of uh, uh, things, meaning slash run, slash proc, slash this, which need to be drivable during that time. So um, if you want to know the details about this setting, or actually about any of the settings that I'm talking about, do have a look at the man pages. And we have updated some of them uh, a little bit. But the idea still is that this is supposed to be something like a Boolean, even though it actually accepts uh, more than two values. Um, but yeah. I hope there are not too many computer scientists in the room who have a problem with that. Anyway, um, okay. Now, the rest of my slides are basically just um, uh, all the individual little bits that you can set there and uh, um, what the benefit of this is. Like, uh, yeah, the first one, I think, um, which is actually one of the most relevant ones, is um, user equals. User equals allows you to run a uh, service as a specific system user. Um, now, Unix, the way it is built, um, all the access control was traditionally built only around the concept of users and groups. This is hence one of the like uh, most traditional and most efficient and most globally understood way um, how you can lock down your services. Um, now, many of the well-known system services, like Apache and Cups and, and whatever else those are, generally do this kind of stuff internally. And there's a good reason why you might want to do that, because um, if you drop privileges and stop being root and become a user that is not root, um, then you first might need to acquire some resources that require privileges before you do so, um, because afterwards you can't. However, user equals is incredibly useful um, if you uh, write your own unit files and don't want to bother with all of that and know that you won't require any, any um, uh, privilege access anyway. Um, something that is very closely related to user is dynamic user. So the first one, like user equals, accepts a username and that username needs to exist, right? You need to create it first. With dynamic user is something that is, uh, um, you can use in conjunction. Um, if you use it, dynamic user is a Boolean and it permits you to say, um, yeah, run this as an unprivileged user, run this as something that is not root. But do not, uh, you do not require that this um, user is actually um, allocated ahead. 
but instead the unit is allocated dynamically at the moment the service starts and is automatically released at the moment the service ends. This is a very, very powerful concept because basically it allows you to run services in a, in a security context that lives exactly as long as that service lives. This, it, it doesn't come without drawbacks, right? Like because the way Unix is designed, um, user IDs are sticky in general. Meaning like um, if, a, if a process runs as user ID 500 or something and creates a file, then that file will be owned by user ID 500. Now, if we introduce a concept of dynamic user IDs, um, then this becomes a problem. Because if the service then ends and the file continues to exist, it will continue to exist being owned by user ID 500, even at a time when the user doesn't exist anymore. Now, if the, uh, the way how Unix works, user IDs might be reassigned to the next user later on, meaning that it gets access to a file that um, it better shouldn't get access to because it's from the previous run of the thing. Now, that's a big problem. Um, our current approach, how to make it so that this doesn't become a problem is that as soon as you turn on dynamic user, you'll also lose write access to quite a few directories. You will still have write access to slash temp and slash var temp and to slash run to, with some limitations. Um, but um, you will lose access in the general case. Like you cannot write files like to random places in slash user anymore. In that regard, it's a little bit like the protect system that I already mentioned. Um, and the files where you can write, like to slash temp and slash bar temp, are lifecycle bound to your service. Meaning that if you do create something in temp and bar temp, it's automatically removed uh, at the same time the service stops, which is also the same time as the user is, uh, is removed. I hope you could follow it. Any questions about this a bit? So basically, you can create any of files with this dynamically user? Well, it depends. Like, I mean, if you're sure, if you want to lock something that, uh, against another service that, that runs with something similar, no, you can't. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's an incredibly useful thing. Like, for example, if you, if you implement something that, that, that calculates, like, 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 like that, that has a, a, a workload to process, you can quickly start something with this, let it run in a completely secure environment, and let it die, and it just needs to upload its, or push its data somewhere, um, for example, to the front or whatever else. Um, and can then exit. It's uh, also particularly nice if you have stuff that stores things in databases. It's uh, in particularly nice even if you combine it with a concept called socket activation. I'm not sure if you, like, I'm pretty sure that the people who already looked at the system in one way or another have to come in contact with the concept of socket activation. It basically allows you to start service instances depending on incoming connections, networking connections, which basically means that um, a service can run exactly as long as uh, a connection um, is, is uh, being active uh, from, from, from the client side. And now if you think about this, it basically can mean that, um, that like SSH, for example, the talent classically was, was implemented in a way. If you use it that way, now not in the talent or SSH case, but in other cases, um, you have a nice uh, functionality that you can have, uh, I don't know, 20 uh, parallel instances of a specific service that um, each individually process one currently um, going on connection and each one of them has a different use that it was dynamically um, allocating goes away the instance, that specific instance goes away. Um, I hope this was something you could still follow. Um, here's something else, capability bounding set. Capability bounding set, in contrast to the user stuff that I explained first, is a more exotic um, feature. It has been a viable limit for quite some time, probably almost 10 years, but it's not as well known as, as the concept of users are. Capabilities um, are something where basically, so traditionally in Unix, if you're root, you have all rights to do anything you like. If you're something that is not root, you have very limited rights. The concept of capabilities tries to make this less binary, mm -hmm. meaning that there can be processes around that can do some privileged things but not all privileged things. Meaning, for example, if you have uh, something like uh, um, NTPD, right, the, the daemon that deals with synchronizing the clock across a network, like uh, synchronizing a local clock with something on the internet, that daemon, for example, it needs some kind of privilege. It needs the privilege to access the local clock and being able to change that, because that is a privileged operation, so that not any random code that runs the system can do that. However, it doesn't need any other privileges. It doesn't need the privilege to 
access um, files of users that it doesn't run as. It doesn't need privileges for anything else. With capabilities, um, you basically have bit fields where the, it's, it's kernel defined, so it has nothing to do with systemd at that point. Um, a, a bit field where you have something like 40 individual writes that a process can have. And uh, if you have all of these bits, you are what traditionally is called root. If you have none of these bits, um, you are what's traditionally called normal user. Now, with capability dynamic sets, you can uh, uh, turn these uh, capabilities on individually for each um, service, and you get a guarantee that that service cannot gain any further permission with it ever. Right? The only way you can, can acquire that is by talking to some other service that has other uh, permissions and uh, somehow gets it to do what it wants. But it will, in its own code, never be able to acquire that. Um, related to that is a setting called Secubits. I'm not sure I want to go into much detail because it's very low level. Um, just saying uh, that basically permits you to lock things further down regarding these kind of capability bits. Um, private TMT we already talked about. Um, then there's private devices. Private devices is a simple boolean. Um, as the name suggests, it gives a service a private set of devices. Specifically meaning, um, let's say you have, um, you have a database, MySQL. Databases generally do not have to have direct access to physical devices. They don't um, write to, um, I don't know, my graphics card, or no, not my printer, or not my sound card. They generally, all they need is just access to file systems. With private devices, it's a boolean if you turn it on. Basically, um, the service runs in, a, in, a, in an environment where slash dev is not a fully populated version of the devices that your system has, but is reduced to a version where only the pseudo devices exist. Specifically, um, uh, dev random, dev u random, dev null, dev zero, and these kind of things. These, like on Unix, these are traditionally, ex traditionally exposed as devices, but in reality aren't really devices. They are they're virtual like, pseudo devices that are basically just the way how Linux exposes a specific set of APIs. They don't actually correspond to any physical device. At least I have never seen a physical device that's uh, dev zero uh, with that. Um, so, um, yeah, it's a very, very simple way. For all services where you know they don't ever need physical device access, turn that on, and you can be sure that these services, for example, cannot get raw disk access anymore. They cannot get raw access to your camera anymore and film what you do. Um, so if anyone exploits, um, like, I don't know, my <laughs> database server now, you can be sure that you can't film you while what you're doing in front of it. Um, did you have a question? Um, is there a global setting for that? No, there isn't. Like, uh, I mean, there, there are a number of services which, of course, need that, like cups and things like that. But uh, no, for, for this, there's nothing because um, it, you always have to have some knowledge about the specific service um, to know that you can turn it on. Like, for example, for cups, I couldn't, but I know that for my database, I could. But then again, you know what I'm just saying about all the databases that they don't need raw device access. Some versions of Oracle actually can do the raw device access and manages the raw devices. So while it generally makes sense to drop this, like and use this, in some specific setup, it doesn't. So um, turning themselves globally is, is probably create a lot of problems. Can they get the false on the other way? Sorry? To get false for the specific service. Um, yeah, 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 you mean like a lot of But I mean, this is, this is stuff we added um, relatively late in the game. You know, um, services have been around in Unix since uh, basically Unix exists. And then with SystemD, we kind of adopted the same model that, that um, it was already there and extended on it. But now, if we would introduce something where you can globally turn around these settings and turn them on all by default, we would essentially break all the existing services because they don't expect to run this way. And uh, that's probably something we can't pull off that easily. But you're absolutely right. If we would design that stuff now, I'm pretty sure like all our defaults would be locked, right? Like it would always be everything as, as, as locked down as possible. Everything would run in the sandbox by default. And then the few things like cups and I don't know, something that wants to access my network devices would not use this, but everything else would. How far is upstream progress and Unix files? Do the developers care for their security features like disabled private device system service and this near? Um, so, um, that's a good question, like, it really depends, like, many of the distributions, like, Fedora, at least, has a, has a, like, people are pushing for that, like, private TMT, for example, is, is, is enabled pretty much across the distributions. 
But um, yeah, it really depends. Like it's you know the, the problem is again like it's very very hard to convince people to actually turn that on, right? Because um, it's not a neighbor. But um, I don't know. If you work on a process, I would only convince you yeah, on a project and would only like to ask you to ask them to turn this on by default. And, uh, because it's usually the, the developers of services who know best what they can turn on, but they can't, right? Because developers do know if they need physical devices. Is it possible to turn it on and why do we Well, not with this one, but um, there's another one like which I have somewhere in my slides here. I got a lot of slides as you see. This one here, for example. Uh, which allows you to do precisely that. It basically allows you to build a, 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 a whitelist um, of devices, um, and it will by default include the same device that I mentioned at zero and so on and so on. Um, but uh, yeah, you can say additional. But I mean, you always have the, the problem that you need to know which device to provide access to, and that usually involves admin involvement. Um, anyway, let's jump back. I mean, it's, by the way, completely okay if we don't cover all those slides. It's, uh, I don't know, if somebody asks a question like yours, for example, I can jump to this slide and then, uh, yeah, that's a good thing about it. Anyway, uh, other point. I mean, in fact, I much prefer it if we have a discussion here than me just going through all the slides. So, um, Next one, private network. It's also very, very simple Boolean. If you turn it on, the service runs in a, in a, in a total virtual network that consists only of a loopback device and nothing else. So many, many services, like for example, um, I don't know, uh, what do I have here? Um, I don't know, my database, for example, doesn't necessarily need direct network access. It's completely fine if there's only one uh, way into that service, like for example, through socket activation and system view, but that's a different question. Um, but I don't know, like for example, my Bluetooth um, environment or, or any kind of hardware manager locally that only serves something for local um, uh, clients, doesn't need network access. If you turn this on, um, all you do, uh, you, you set it to true, um, then yeah, there's no way it can do, do any kind of communication with the outside on its own anymore. It can only do so by communicating with some other local service and trying to get it to do what it wants. <coughs> that is a very, very simple way to lock down services. Of course, it's difficult to apply if your service actually does need network access. Um, uh, I know if I turn it on and uh, the service needs it, is there a kind of uh, log message or something you are like, ah, oh, okay, maybe, or I suggest uh, Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a very good question. Like, many of these settings, um, like, we use kernel functionality to enforce them, right? Like, the system is not involved in the actual enforcement. We just tell the kernel, please set things up so and go ahead and enforce it. Now, the kernel doesn't necessarily generate more messages in this case. But you can actually get it to um, through audit stuff, not for the networking stuff, but for the file access stuff, you can do that. For the networking stuff, many, many tenants at least log if they don't manage to get uh, to send messages. Um, they, they, because the, the applications will get errors in this case. They, they will get the message back like, I don't have a route to that address, um, because they don't, because they don't have a route to anything but the look-back device. Um, so, yeah, if you ask about the specific option, my recommendation would be look at the logs and down. Um, okay, we'll go to the next one. Um, I already briefly touched this one. This is uh, yet yeah, no as full and strict um, are the actual settings. No means you run like your normal run, you can write access, whatever you want to write access. Uh, yes means um, search users read only. Full means yet yeah, search user and slash etsy are, full of, uh, are read only. And strict means everything is read only with the exception of slash run, slash box, slash this, and whatever is covered by protect term. Um, there's read write pass. Sometimes it might actually say, it sense to configure the access like that you can have to specific files and directories in a more fine grained way, right? And for that we have uh, read write pass, read only pass, and an inaccessible pass. Read write pass does what the name suggests and um, permits access to a specific directory. You can use that in combination actually with Protect System and everything else. So you can basically define your very own policies this way where you can say, yeah, generally I don't want it to have access except for that one directory. Um, Read-only pass, as the name suggests, makes something read-only. Inaccessible pass makes it entirely inaccessible. And what this actually means is that um, a, a, a file directory is overmounted 
with a uh, uh, basically an empty tempfs directory um, that has no permissions to access. So you can be sure that if you run it that way, um, yeah, there's not going to be anything to see. Um, yeah, I mean, it, these options exist, but it's generally our intention to make these things like handwriting policies like that, but listing all the paths is usually a bit cumbersome. And that's the reason why we have Protect System and Protect Home and these kind of things, to make things easier to use and to make it, like push people to use things in a specific way. Because ultimately, Protect System is nothing but a shortcut for, for a relearning paths, basically. Uh, No, unfortunately not. They have to exist again. It's a limitation of long ago. For the way things are implemented. Um, having so many, or allowing so many different settings, I mean, how do you test that, or how often are you get all those work together? Just like how do I test it on the system side of things? Uh, we have a large um, uh, CI, um, uh, but then again, we can never have enough tests, of course. We cannot test all the possible combinations. Uh, but we'll try. If you run into any combination that doesn't work for you, let us know and we'll fix it and we'll add a test for it so it doesn't happen again. But it's like with any kind of software, I guess. Uh, next one, private users. Um, it's a relatively recent addition. It basically allows you to run a uh, service in a way where um, the user um, table is um, uh, detached from the host's user table. What does it specifically mean? Um, if you, as an administrator, log into a system and type ps um, or, or top or something like that, you, use, you see all the processes running, you see under which users they are running. If you turn this on, and you would do the same from inside the environment the service runs in, then uh, uh, you won't be able to do that. What you will ins instead see is that either Processes are owned by root, or by a specific user nobody, or by the user that yourself are running as, if you follow what I mean. Meaning, um, it's, a, it's a relatively efficient way how you can detach user information between services and the host. And this is particularly useful for one use case, and that one use case is if you use cheroots. Um, do you know what cheroots are? Does anybody not know what a cheroot is? Wow, you all know. Okay, there are a couple of people who don't know what that is. Uh, Chir Chiroots, um, like it's, it's short for change root. And it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, a traditional Unix way how you can run a specific set of processes in an environment where instead of seeing the entire file system hierarchy of the system, they only see a subset of it, like a subtree of it. Um, so, um, like it's, it's a, a traditional, very efficient way how to lock things down because you basically say, yeah, I'm running this web server, but instead of seeing the full tree, it will only see as its own full tree a subtree of the main tree, if you follow what I mean. Um, and uh, this one is specifically useful if you use Chiroots because Chiroots have this problem they always had and was never really fixed that um, you need to synchronize the user database because user databases are traditionally in Unix um, stored in a file called etsy pass wd, right? So if you have a service that runs in a cheroot and um, it uh, looks at any kind of file, any kind of process and wants to know who is this file or process owned by, it does so by asking the kernel for the user ID for this number that identifies the user, then tries that to look that up via etsy pass wd, eh, eh, yeah. And then uh, um, it will come to a completely different conclusion inside the cheroot than on the outside of the cheroot. Because uh, unless the files are always kept in sync, um, they will differ. Do you follow what I mean? Um, now, if you set this, you can make this uh, process go away. Because it basically means that, yeah, inside of that service, you will only see three different kinds of users. The root user, something that is the nobody user, and uh, your own user. Everything else will show up as being owned by the nobody user. The nobody user, by the way, and like, I mean, you all know that I hope, that user ID zero is root. Um, uh, everything that is not zero is some unprivileged user, but there's one special user called nobody, which usually has, the, or which kind of always has the um, number the 655, 3, 4, like this. Uh, 
2 squared uh, 2 to 16 minus 2. Um, and uh, it has a special semantics in, 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 in Linux at least. Um, everything that can't be mapped to something more useful is mapped to that. Um, anyway, I hope you could, could understand why this is awesome. This basically relieves you from the requirement to uh, um, synchronize as you pass WD. Yeah, root directory is, is the switch how you can actually do true roots in system. You can just set that for a service and specify a directory, and then that service is run um, from that uh, directory so that it becomes its own top level thing. This one is a, it's more than just a classic true root. Because it will it will like a system you will try to implement it with, with a normal true root system call. But in many cases where actual namespaces are involved, this will actually be upgraded to a full namespace environment. The distinctions uh, between those two is probably worth the talk of its own, a very technical one, and I don't want to go into detail, but just that you know. Um, yeah, another one is protect kernel tunables. Um, it's again a boolean, it's very simple to use. What it does, it makes um, a couple of kernel tunables unavailable. Kernel tunables are these settings like that, for example, are in slash proc and slush, uh, slash, slash proc slash sys. If you know those, like the stuff that you can configure in etcs control of conf, like it's it's how on Linux a number of kernel settings are configured. It's it's this weird way how Linux configures things, right? Like because everything's a file, um, they expose settings as files, and when you echo ones and zeros into them, um, with protect kernel tunables, um, you can make um, all of proxies read only. Plus a couple of other things, like for example, there's a system call that you can call instead that makes the same changes. It will also make a lot of the stuff from slash this um, unavailable. Uh, the takeaway really is, if you turn this on, um, that specific um, service cannot modify any of the um, um, kernel settings anymore. Um, they can only be set um, by uh, the admin itself. Any questions about that? Um, related to this uh, protect control groups, um, you probably need to know a lot about okay. position to be. Well, why are these kernel tunables exposed to users? I mean, you can read them, but they don't have right? Yeah, you can write them quite a number of them because you, often you need to make changes. Like, for example, um, what's the good idea for an example for a proxy with like this control? A wireless device. Or, for example, IP forwarding. Like, it's probably the best known source control. Like, when, I, when, when people want to turn their, their computers that normally just accept packets into something that not only accepts packets but also spits them out again, then you have this Boolean which tells the kernel to do that, and that is exposed as one of the sys controls. But it's probably not a good idea to um, allow any daemon to uh, change that thing except if it's actually a networking uh, uh, configuration then. Right? And there are many, many, many settings. I mean, um, like, yes, yeah, swapping is whatever kinds. You can configure weird stuff there. Probably half of it's completely unnecessary, but some people would want it, so they can get it. Um, yeah, put to protect a control group similar to this. Um, I don't want to go too much detail because for that I would have to explain what control groups are. <coughs> and that's too complex. But control groups basically are the way how services are explained to the kernel as being services. And you can do resource management and all kinds of other things with them. And uh, yeah, it's also a Boolean if you turn it on. Then basically, uh, that specific service um, can manipulate the, the service that I can anymore. Do you need these? Uh, yes, you do. Because, like, protect system, what it will protect is actually the, the vendor supplied binaries that you got. Like, like when, when you install Debian or Fedora, then it's going to be slash user, like the stuff. Like the, the compiled binary cell will be protected by protect system. What this does, um, it will um, protect a certain facet of the Linux API, like runtime stuff. It's not going to protect binaries, it's going to be protect, a, protect APIs. Okay, all, all real files except the couple of files. Do you still need protect control groups if there's only a CD process allowed to change the control 
Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 like, uh, okay, so oh, why, uh, I was supposed to repeat the question, but I didn't, sorry. Um, but the, this question was about whether this is actually necessary if we have a policy that only a single process is allowed to actually change the control groups anyway. You know, that policy exists, but it's a philosophical policy that um, the kernel people and, and, and the system people agree on. It's not a uh, policy that is actually enforced in code. Meaning, uh, you as an administrator can always lock onto the system and manipulate control groups as much as you want. There's nothing stopping you from that. That being said, the idea is still, system does that, or something else does it for a, a delegated subtree. But in, in general, um, yeah, you're not supposed to. But of course, I mean, we can't stop you and we shouldn't stop you. I mean, you're there and do whatever you like. But then again, um, I'm pretty sure that uh, Apache, for example, should not be able to manipulate that. Uh, because of, yeah, you know, because you wrote resource management is implemented by that, you can actually do really, really evil shit with that. Um, you can lock the system up and everything if you have access to that. Um, <coughs> okay. This is cool, but who do you think is responsible for maintaining the ceiling files in this secure way? The at local level or the distribution or the like? That's a very good question. So the question was um, regarding who's responsible for making the settings. Best thing would be upstreams, right? That's what I want. I want, for example, that cups um, or or MySQL or whatever else they ship the unit files and turn everything on again. Um, but then again, upstreams tend to be much much slower um, on these things than, than other players are. If the upstreams don't, next best thing is distributions, right? And Fedora, for example, does that systematically because Fedora added in all the services uh, service files anyway where they were missing. They also uh, turned this on. So that's the second best thing. Um, and uh, if they do, you can always do it locally. But then again, um, there's also the thing, usually people don't run unmodified off-the-shelf stuff, right? Usually they run their own service in some way, their own uh, web page that they program, right? And for that stuff, I want the admins or users or something to turn this off for themselves as well. That's why I'm doing the talk here, basically. But uh, ultimately, I also hope that maybe there's the uh, distribution package area so you know, all you can uh, uh, turn it on, can uh, convince or an upstream or something, can convince this project you know, to uh, make use of it. Uh, do you happen to know by chance the project called FileJail? Yes, I do. Uh, is it possible to use this kind of technology to start my, let's say, password manager with restricted rights? Well, so um, it, 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 Jail is mostly focused, as I understood it at least, um, uh, on, on user level software, meaning your web browser, your editor, your web processor, whatever. Um, this stuff that I'm talking about here is about system level stuff. It's about system services. So, and that's quite a difference. Um, underneath, they actually use the same technology provided with the car. Underneath, they have the same thing you could uh, say, except that this is always about privileges um, that are usually beyond what the user space can do anyway, if you follow what I mean. Like for example, users, like, like unprivileged user space, your web browser can't access the like, modify control groups anyway, so you don't really have to think much about that. It would still always make sense to add a second layer of, of security, <laughs> but system services generally can do. Um, anyway, I've only got one minute left, so I can show you all the wonderful other things that there are. <laughs> um, and what the future is. But it's completely fine that we didn't. Like, uh, um, I would very much like that we actually have this discussion. Um, given that we all, all still have one minute, we can take three more questions or something. Can you do it the other way around? That I add the maximum security set to a unit file and then see what doesn't work anymore? Uh, so, I, um, I think that would be a way you could try to get your service to be more secure. Yeah, the question was uh, if we, if we uh, can define a maximum security policy in some way and then have the individual services go away from that. It was kind of what, what I mentioned earlier. If we would start this stuff today, that's how it would work. But because we have to retain the compatibility, that's kind of not really what we can do. That said, um, we're currently working with something called portable services. It's supposed to be the project where we take some of the ideas of container management and apply them uh, to, to um, traditional services. And in that model, um, if you run one of those portable services, it will default to everything is locked down, and then you have to exclude um, what you don't want to do. The secret tool, right? Oh, you're looking for a debugging tool that, that helps you figure out what, where you're in. Yeah. 
the service Yeah, we currently don't have that. Like, uh, it's, it's difficult again because um, it, all these uh, things are implemented using kernel functionality that sits in wildly different places, right? And they generally, you know, if something locks about it, it needs to be the kernel that locks about it. And the kernel doesn't have locks at least. There is, as mentioned, like there's audit um, control or something, which is a tool I personally don't like very much, but it will deliver to you um, this kind of logging for at least the, the everything that, that is about access to uh, uh, file systems. But I hope that's an answer. Um, my time's over, so thank you very much for your interest. If you have any further questions, I'll be outside and uh, um, we can discuss further. Thank you very much.